come before you on my knees I am filled with humility My arms are open, praising your name How could they do this and walk away? You stepped down from your throne I never knew this much love could be shown I am blessed As the blood drips from your crown May all the lost souls be found May the weary find rest My heart is cleansed by the blood Washing my sins away, I am loved My heart is cleansed by the blood Washing my sins away, I am loved At the cross, I can hardly breathe The pain consuming every ounce of me You made this choice on your own But this pain you feel, I feel it in my bones You stepped down from your throne I never knew this much love could be shown I am blessed As the blood drips from your crown May all the lost souls be found May the weary find rest My heart is cleansed by the blood Washing my sins away, I am loved My heart is cleansed by the blood Washing my sins away, I am loved You stepped down from your throne I never knew this much love could be shown I am blessed As the blood drips from your crown May all the lost souls be found May the weary find rest You stepped down from your throne I never knew this much love could be shown I am blessed Blood drips from your crown May all the lost souls be found May the weary find rest My heart is cleansed by the blood Washing my sins away I am loved My heart is cleansed by the blood Washing my sins away, I am loved I am loved I am loved You step down from your throne I never knew this much love could be shown The people stood yelling, crucify! And it breaks our hearts every time 
where Jesus' death occurs every time someone is ignored, mistreated, oppressed. Crucify tears away at God's beloved. The first of our shadows this Good Friday night is found in John chapter 18, verses 1 through 14. Jesus is arrested. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he. Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell on the ground. Again they asked him, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words that he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away, shall I, not, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers, with its commander and the Jewish officials, arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father of all Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Our opening hymn, Lead Me to the Cross.
The second of our shadows comes from the Gospel according to St. John 18, verses 15, 16, and 25 through 27. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back and spoke to the servant girl on duty there and brought Peter in. You aren't one of the, this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around the fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself, so they asked him, You aren't one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the rooster began to crow. Let us pray. Ever present God, on this Good Friday night, our whole world is engulfed in shadows as if we remember the story of Jesus' death. We confess that we want to push the fast forward button on this familiar story because it hurts so much. It hurts to think of the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. It hurts to imagine Jesus abandoned and suffering on the cross with only a handful and a faithful few watching him breathe his last breath. It hurts to watch your light overtaken by the shadows of the world. But we must find our place in this crucifixion story and feel the pain that is there. The pain of the world, of faithless decisions, of betrayal, of oppression. Jesus entered that pain out of faithfulness to you and to us, to witness to the truth that is justice, wholeness, and love. We confess, O oh God, we are afraid to enter this pain with Jesus. Strengthen us with your courage. Offer glimpses of hope in the shadows of death. Let us know you are present with us here in this moment of pain, now and always. Beloved followers of Jesus, it is okay to feel hurt and uncomfortable as you enter into this story and imagine your place in it. Know that God meets you in the story with comfort as well as challenge, with courage as well as love. Amen. The third of our shadows tonight comes from John chapter 18, verses 28 through 38. This is the trial of Jesus before Pilate. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace, because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. We have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. I'm a king. And in fact, the reason I was born and came into this world was to testify to you the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, 
I find no basis for a charge against him. Pilate gives us a story of ambition. Now ambition is a word that denotes strong desire for distinction, for elevation, for honor, for political power, for fame. And ambition is probably a bad thing when someone is willing to sacrifice their personal and professional relationships in order to achieve a goal. When ambition is not channeled by one's values, it can lead to decisions that may net short-term benefits, but which gradually isolate a person from meaningful relationships. Pilate was the most powerful man in that area of the Roman Empire. And you don't get to that position by chance. It takes connections, it takes networking, and when it pays off, it's really massive. Pilate was accountable only to Rome, and he stood above everyone else in that province. He was in charge of the military, he was in charge of the finances, and he was in charge of the judicial system. Now in the United States, we distribute these roles among various branches of government, but not so here. Pilate had it all. So, so this hobo with the Jewish Sanhedrin over Jesus needed some of his action before he could seek a more pleasant diversion elsewhere. But Pilate's initial impression was that Jesus was a person who posed no threat. He was some, some ragtag who somehow rankled the Jewish hierarchy, but someone who was really no threat. The charges were made, and Pilate goes through the motions. He asks, so you are a king? And Jesus replies, you say that I'm a king? For this I was born, for this I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? Jesus seems more like a would-be philosopher than a threat to national security, but really, hardly one worth listening to. Pilate may not discuss the truth with Jesus, but Pilate does know the truth, at least to some extent. He knows one very important truth, which is that Jesus is an innocent man. And Pilate will declare that truth again and again in the story. Three times he says, I find no case against him. And what Pilate says is true. So, if Pilate is the most powerful man in the province, and if he knows that Jesus is innocent, is he capable of acting in accordance with what he knows to be true? Now the story unfolds like, a, like an intricate chess game. Pilate's making a move, let's call it plan A. When he says he finds no case against Jesus, he proposes that Jesus simply be released, as was customary during the holiday. But plan A fails. The other side blocks and wants this terrorist release instead. So let's try plan B. If release won't work, how about trying to placate this opposition? Pilate orders a beating, which leaves the prisoner battered and bleeding, and the soldiers hang this touch of putting a crown of thorns on Jesus' head. Pilate says again, I find no case against him. So is this brutality now enough? The answer comes back, nope, not enough. The sense is to finish what you started, Pilate, you be gone to brutality, go ahead and finish the course, have him crucified. This is not the way the story is supposed to be going. Pilate tells Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you or the power to crucify you? But that comment only leaves us wondering. If Pilate has the power to release Jesus, and if he knows that Jesus is innocent, then why doesn't he do what is true? Or is Pilate's story of being controlled simply an illusion? But those leaders' words intrude on Pilate's ear. If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Every man 
who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. And that is the finishing touch. Without the emperor, there's no career. Without the emperor, there is no hope for ambition. Without the emperor, Pilate's future collapses. So at the judgment seat, Pilate sells out. When it's ambition versus truth, then ambition wins out. Pilate, the most powerful man in the province, proves that he is powerless to do what he knows to be true. Having pronounced Jesus innocent, he hands him over to be crucified. Now the story leading up to Jesus' Jesus' crucifixion is disturbing. And one wonders, well, why even tell it? Why not just skip it? Pretend it's not there. We tell it because it is an extended exercise in truth telling. It shows that by unmasking human pretensions for what they are, the story shows us the disturbing character of the world to which we belong. As well, as well as the radical nature and radical character of love with which God meets it. You see, God has his own story to tell. And that too leads to the cross. If the cross tells us who human beings are, the cross also tells us who God is. And for God, it is the story of giving. What would God give to restore the relationship that human pretensions, human disloyalties, human greed, human ambitions have shattered? Now during the Last Supper, Jesus said that greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. The idea that people show love by what they are willing to give, and in our own settings, people might give a gift or send a card, they might give up their time, or they might give their tears. So to follow that pattern to the end, then the greatest gift one can give is one's whole life, one's whole self. The highest form of love is to give up one's life for one's friends. If the cross tells us who human beings are, the cross also tells us who God is, and for God, it is the story of giving. Yet God must go beyond even that. God isn't content merely to reaffirm those friendships that already exist. God is about creating relationship where alienation exists. John tells us that God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. So this is not a story in which God simply loved the world of blue skies and beautiful sunsets, or in which God loved the world of gentle breezes and flowers in the spring. The story of the crucifixion is that God so loved the world that hated him, that God so loved the world that rejected him, that God so loved the world that turned away from him that he gave his only son to be crucified in order to bring that world back into relationship with himself. The cross is the way God evangelizes the world. For it is in God's radical word of self-giving love which says, this is the length to which I will go to have you. This is what I give to make you mine. So in this narrative of the gospel, it is not human loyalty or principle or ambition that carry the day. Each one, in turn, fails. But through God's loyalty to people, God's principled commitment to truth, and God's ambition to redeem the world he created, the stories of people like those we meet in the gospel can be recast. The stories of those who, like those we meet in the gospel, can be your case. See, the promise of life comes as the stories we tell about ourselves are challenged and then rewritten in the light of this story of God. Amen. Please stand.
Please join us for some music. This is Maybe is the Cross.
The fourth of our shadows this Good Friday is written in John chapter 18, verses 38 through chapter 19, verses 16. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at a time, at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to the, that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where did you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize that I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed, handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let, let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat him on the judge's seat at a palace at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king. Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked, We have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. The music is take up.
the fifth of the shadows. In John chapter 19, verses 16 through 27. This is from the cross. Jesus called forth the beloved community. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic, Aramaic is called Gobatha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his house. Let us pray. Ever-present God, we are amazed that Jesus, nearing his death, reached out to comfort and empower those dearest to him. At the foot of the cross, he called his mother and his beloved disciple into a new community. Give us the grace and the courage to join them there, welcoming all into this new covenant and love of grace. Amen. The sixth of our shadows is from John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. It's Jesus dies. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus is dead. It is finished. The seventh of our shadows. From John 19, 38 through 42. Just Jesus is laid in the tomb. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night, Nicodemus bought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they made Jesus there. Jesus is laid in the tomb, and his followers leave him to God in the silence and in the rest of Sabbath. You, too, are invited to depart into the shadows of